And so good evening, everybody, and welcome back to the show. Uh, it's uh, Chris Kerwin here from Astronomy by the Bay, and uh, you're back on my channel again. Uh, welcome back to uh, episode 10 for us now. Uh, we're uh, still in the cloudy skies <laughs> in St. John, episode 10, and we've only had two clear nights. Uh, but we're still plugging away at things to, uh, to see if we can improve things. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to switch it up just a little bit. Um, I'm going to do... Uh, our introductions here first of all and then uh, we'll do a talk on uh, Venus what we see up in our uh, sky now in the evenings uh, then uh, we're going to bring on uh, Emile Cormier and he's going to do a talk on the Rosette Nebula uh, Paul Owen is sitting here waiting for uh, a talk on SET telescopes so I guess there's my introductions <laughs> <laughs> So we've got Paul Owen uh, in Hampton our RASC member in Hampton and we have Emile Cormier up in Bucktooth tonight evening guys Good evening. So we're set to go here. I guess uh, what we're going to try to offer first of all is a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation I prepared for uh, the planet Venus, which is what we get up in our, our uh, sky this morning, uh, in, in the evening sky now. Of course, yeah, at the end of uh, Paul's talk, if we have enough time, we're going to get into uh, what's offered uh, next week uh, through Stellarium as well. And I have some uh, photos that were dropped off to me through our my recent moon contest. So... Uh, I'll be displaying those as well if we get the time. So I guess we'll get started. And uh, just give me a second here, I'll share my screen. Let's find my mouse. There we go. And second, I'll bring this one up first of all. Hey, how's that look? Okay. Yes. Great. Okay, so a little bit about the uh, the planet Venus, uh, and especially because we're able to see it uh, quite clearly now in the evening sky. You're able to hear me, okay, Paul? I uh, yes, I can. Okay, perfect. Okay, so Venus is the. Uh, uh, what we're looking at right now is the orbit of Venus. Uh, we see Venus in our southwestern sky now for about the next uh, month or two anyway. Um, it's going to keep climbing up that line that we see there. That's the actual orbit of Venus, and, and it follows a line called the ecliptic, which is the path that the sun, the moon, and the planets take uh, around our sky. So Venus is going to continue to uh, get higher in our sky, uh, right up till about uh, mid-March or so, when it's going to be at its greatest eastern elongation. That means it's going to be the farthest east in the sky that it can get. And then it's going to drip, uh, or going to fall back uh, really quickly, uh, back uh, below the horizon again. So it'll take be about another month or so before it drops down through, but it'll, uh, it'll uh, retreat very quickly in our sky. This is just a shot of uh, what we see this is just out in my backyard, basically. A couple of trees there, and that's Venus in the center. Of course, Venus is the uh, the third brightest object in their sky, and its only uh, thing that shines uh, better than it is the, the sun and the moon. And we're going to get into why that is here in a few minutes. Here's another shot uh, that was captured uh, recently with my phone, um, the crescent moon that we had at the first of the month there, and uh, Venus in the same shot. So you can see how bright it is there. And if you're out in the evening sky and you see the, the uh, bright star in the southwest, we uh, call our evening star, that's the planet Venus. Venus is the second planet from the sun and it's our closest uh, planetary neighbor. Similar in structure and size to the Earth, Venus uh, spins slowly in the opposite direction from most planets. Its thick atmosphere traps heat in a runaway greenhouse effect, making it the hottest planet in our solar system, with the surface temperatures hot enough to melt lead. Uh, glimpses below the clouds reveal volcanoes and deformed mountains. And Venus is named for the ancient Roman goddess of beauty, who was known as Aphrodite to the ancient Greeks. In Roman mythology, Venus was the goddess of love, sex, beauty, and fertility. And she was the Roman counterpart to the Greek Aphrodite. However, Roman Venus had many abilities beyond the Greek Aphrodite. She was the goddess of victory, fertility, and even prostitution. You guys still there? 
Hello. Sounds like I've lost you. Okay. Yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> Everybody was Just quiet. <laughs> Keeping quiet. <laughs> That's the scary part when that happens. <laughs> okay. You don't want to hear my, my stomach growl, so I have the mic off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll carry on. <laughs> Just want to make sure I wasn't talking to myself there. All right, uh, with a radius of about uh, 6,000 kilometers, Venus is roughly the same size as Earth, just slightly smaller than Earth. Um, and we can see here we've got uh, Mercury, Venus, uh, Earth, and Mars all together. So it's roughly our twin. And uh, I'm going to slip onto the next slide here. And from an average distance of about 108 million kilometers, Venus is about uh, 0.7 astronomical units away from our Sun. And one astronomical unit, or an AU, is the distance uh, from the Sun to the Earth. It takes uh, sunlight about six minutes to travel from the Sun to Venus. Venus's rotation and its orbit are unusual in several ways. Venus is just one of two planets that rotates from east to west. Only Venus and Uranus have this backwards rotation. We're not quite sure why that is, but we believe that uh, Venus may have been hit uh, in its early life uh, by a large uh, planetesimal. It completes uh, one rotation in about 243 Earth days, the longest day of any planet in our solar system, even longer than a whole year on Venus. But the Sun doesn't rise and set each day on Venus like it does on most other planets. On Venus, one day-night cycle takes about 117 Earth days because Venus rotates in the direct opposite of its orbital revolution around the Sun. Venus makes a complete orbit around the Sun, a year in Venusian time, in 225 Earth days, or slightly less than two Venusian day-night cycles. Its orbit around the Sun is the most circular of any other planet. It's almost nearly a perfect circle. Other planets' orbits are more elliptical or oval-shaped. With an axial tilt of just three degrees, Venus spins nearly upright, and so it does not experience any noticeable seasons. When the solar system settled into its current layout about four and a half billion years ago, Venus formed when gravity pulled the swir swirling gas and dust together to form the second planet from the Sun. Like its fellow terrestrial planets, Venus has a central core and a rocky mantle and a solid crust. And we'll get this skipped ahead. Here we go. <laughs> Venus is in many ways very similar to Earth in its structure. It has an iron core that is approximately 3,200 kilometers in radius. Above that, there is a mantle that's made of hot rock, slowly churning due to the planet's interior heat. The surface is a thin crust of rock that bulges and moves as Venus's mantle shifts and creates volcanoes. From space, Venus is bright white because it is covered with clouds that reflect and scatter sunlight. At the surface, the rocks scatter, uh, are different shades of gray, like rocks on Earth, but the thick atmosphere filters the sunlight so that everything would look orange if you were standing on Venus. And Venus has mountains, valleys, and tens of thousands of volcanoes. The highest mountain on Venus, Maxwell Montes, is 20,000 feet high, similar to the highest mountain on Earth. It is thought that Venus was completely resurfaced by volcanic activity 300 to 500 million years ago. Venus has two large highland areas, Ishtar Terra, about the size of Australia in the North Polar region, and Aphrodite Terra, about the size of South America, straddling the equator and extending for almost 10,000 kilometers. Venus is covered in craters, but none are smaller than one and a half to two kilometers across. That's because small meteoroids burn up in the dense atmosphere, so only the large ones can make it all the way to the surface and create the impact craters. Venus's atmosphere consists mainly of carbon dioxide with clouds of sulfuric acid droplets. The thick atmosphere traps the sun's heat, resulting in surface temperatures higher than 470 degrees Celsius. The atmosphere has many layers with different temperatures. At the level where the clouds are, about 30 miles up from the surface, it's about the same temperature as it is on the surface of the Earth. As Venus moves forward in its solar orbit while slowly rotating backwards on its axis, the top levels of clouds zip around the planet about every four Earth days, 
driven by hurricane force winds that are traveling at about 225 miles or 360 kilometers per hour. Atmospheric lightning bursts light up these quick moving clouds. Speeds within the clouds decrease with cloud height and at the surface are estimated to be just a few miles per hour. On the ground, it would look like a very hazy overcast day on Earth. And the atmosphere is so heavy, it would feel like you were about one mile or 1.6 kilometers deep under the water. No human has ever visited Venus, of course, but the spacecraft that have been there have sent to the surface of Venus do not last very long there. Venus's high surface temperatures overheat the electronics very quickly. So it seems unlikely that a person could survive for long on the Venusian surface. There is speculation about life existing in Venus's distant past, as well as questions about the possibility of life in the cloud top layers of Venus's atmosphere, where the temperatures are less extreme. And Venus offers us phases like the moon does. When we see Venus uh, in, the, in our sky, we'll see it as a, uh, as a waxing crescent, um, a, a, a first quarter uh, phase, uh, the waxing gibbous phase and the full phase. And that's just because of the relationship between the sun and Venus and us at the time. And of course, this is the reason why Venus is so hot. Um, on Earth, of course, uh, incoming sunlight gets uh, redirected back out again and uh, some of the uh, off the, the reflective clouds in a lot of cases. Some of the sunlight, of course, is striking the Earth and it does warm us up. But in the case of Venus, some of the, inc the incoming sunlight uh, gets passed right through and it strikes the surface but then can't escape again. So that's what's caused uh, the greenhouse effect on Venus. And that'll lead to the end of my presentation. So I'll just do this and bring us back. And I guess we're back. So that's, uh, that's pretty interesting um, with Venus and all. So um, when we look at Venus through a telescope from Earth, uh, we can't see any of that rocky surface. But there is rocky surface under there, underneath all those very, very heavy, thick uh, gas and cloud, eh? Yeah, that's it. The, the clouds have, uh, are obscuring our view of Venus. But of course, we have spacecraft now, like a Magellan, that has gone out to Venus and has done radar mapping and uh, can strip the clouds, and we can see what's happening on the surface. Okay. It's a pretty, pretty fascinating planet. It is. It is, and when you're and when you're looking at it through a telescope, um, it does phase, mm -hmm. as well as our moon. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Both inner so planets yeah, will do that. Yeah, yeah, and that's all reflected light off the sun. Depending right. on the angle of, of, our, of us in relation to, to Venus, I guess, eh? And it is the third brightest object in the sky behind the sun and the moon. So, always. Yeah. One of the slides was um, a landscape of uh, Venus uh, showed a mountain or a volcano. Yes. And uh, let me know if I'm wrong, but I believe those were generated by uh, radar, and then they rendered that as a... Uh, an That's image. right. That's right. It's a bit it of a is. false image. Yes, it is. Yeah. Nobody's been on the surface to, to tell us for sure, but <laughs> except for a couple of uh, Russian spacecraft, that's it. And they've only last they only lasted about an hour, I guess, on on the surface. They sent back a few pictures, but so there isn't a whole lot that we can do with with Venus itself as the planet goes. It's a hellish planet for sure. Yeah. And uh, whether we'll ever be there, probably not. But we might uh, we might be able to survive in the in the upper cloud tops of Venus, where the temperature is closer to that is on Earth, and the wind speeds are a lot lower. Yeah. Well, it's one of the nicest looking things in the sky this time of year at twilight or at uh, dusk, rather. Um, when you see that really nice uh, bluish turquoise color, uh, when it's starting to get dark as the western sky is fading and to see that really bright, what most people deem would be a star if they're not, if they don't realize that it's a planet, but it's just stunning to look at this time of year. It sure is. Yeah. Great. Okay, uh, Paul, I guess, has a couple of facts about... Uh, oh, well, okay. Okay, uh, let me see if I can make this happen. Make it so, number one. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so what we're doing, we have a segment for the show, and it's called Rosanna's Fun Facts. 
And um, just to give you a little background on who's Rosanna, because obviously it's not me. Um, Rosanna is a member of the uh, of the St. John Astronomy Club, and uh, she has been for a lot of years. Uh, she's an avid uh, amateur astronomer. And when we were taking uh, the moon course that Chris offered this year uh, at the at the St. John Astronomy Club, um, everybody was coming up with the same kind of facts. You know, how big is a crater? You know, does it have a, a mountain range on it? Was there a rill or a riff? Anyway, all that stuff in it. And she was thinking totally different things. And, uh, and the things that she thought of were really kind of fun facts that weren't scientific, more just some of them are scientific, but some of them are just just tidbits and facts. So what we want to do um, as a segment uh, we're gonna, that's called Rosanna's Fun Facts is just give, uh, she's going to give us uh, some of those to, uh, to um, uh, communicate with everybody. So this week on Rosanna's Fun Facts, we're going to talk about spacesuits. So a full NASA spacesuit costs, and I had no idea, $12 million. And uh, so that puts the Stuart Hughes Diamond Edition hand-stitched suit at $892,000 to shame. The backpack and the control module of these spacesuits are 70% of, of the cost of that $12 million. That's unbelievable. Unreal. And there's only three of those Stuart Hughes Diamond suits still in existence. And they were, of course, some of the first run spacesuits. And uh, I did a little bit more reading on this, and it turns out that... Um, they only make so many spacesuits for uh, this ISS um, program. So they knew what, from its inception to the time that they're going to close it up, which I think is supposed to be sometime in 2024, um, that they had to have so many spacesuits. Well, they've already lost three. Um, and they think that before this program is over, they may not have enough spacesuits to do all this, uh, to finish up their uh, the program. Oh. And... Um, and I found it interesting, but of course, when they make the suits, a, a lot of them are used here on Earth to do all the, um, the, the um, uh, preliminary work. So before you go up into space, you have to know how to float and do all the things you need to do in a space suit. So that's where a lot of them are used. So some of them just get used up and wore out. But it's really interesting. Uh, at $12 million, that's one heck of a, a good looking suit, I'd say. So there is Rosanna's fun fact for the week thank you rosanna <laughs> that's great and thank you paul for bringing that to us appreciate that <laughs> oh that's really uh that is a fun fact no wonder the, the <laughs> missions cost so much eh? 12 million dollars for a suit <laughs> yeah sharp dressed man <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do yeah. they bring those to the dry cleaner or? <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh, vacuum my packed goodness. you'd be vacuum packed unbelievable unbelievable Nice. Okay, so I guess uh, we're ready uh, to move on now to Emil, and Emil is going to do uh, a talk on uh, capture that he did just the other night on the Rosette Nebula. Uh, so Emil is going to give us a, a bit of a clip on how he uh, how he captured it and uh, some data that uh, he has about it, and I have some data for him as well. So we'll get started with that. So Emil, would you like to uh, share your screen? Sure. Um, so uh, if it were clear right now, I'd be uh, doing this live, but since we knew uh, it was going to be cloudy, I pre-recorded this uh, session uh, two nights ago, and I'm just going to play it back uh, a little uh, live stacking. I think that's what we're going to be doing uh, going forward too, folks. Uh, we are going to be able to... Uh... We're going to try to offer images that we have captured even a, a night or two before. Um, it's not necessarily going to be live stocked, but uh, we'll do the best we can to bring images to you. So um, I'm going to start playing back. So this was me uh, telling the instructing the telescope to point at the Rosette Nebula. And we were previously looking at the uh, Witch Head uh, Nebula. We see the the live stack from then. So that's cool. And here I'm um, flipping my filter wheel to hydrogen alpha, and uh, I'll explain later uh, what that means. So 
I cleared the previous stack so that it could start stacking uh, the Rosette Nebula live. So what I'm doing here is uh, called uh, electronically aided astronomy, where instead of using your eye and an eyepiece to look through a telescope, you use a camera and uh, you look at the result um, live through uh, a tablet or a laptop. For, for some people with uh, disabilities or older folks, uh, this is almost the only way they can do uh, astronomy. Um, and what's also nice about uh, this technique is uh, you can share it uh, on the internet like we're doing right now. So uh, here I'm playing with uh, something called uh, stretching. Uh, so that all the thinner details will be brought up and become visible. And as I'm tweaking uh, the stretching, the, there's more and more frames that keep coming in and getting stacked. And by stacked, I mean the data is effectively averaged out. And what that does is it reduces the, the noise while maintaining the same signal. It takes a bit of fiddling around to get the contrast just right. Still a bit noisy at this point, only three frames stacked. Like we, we can see uh, in no time at all, in a matter of a couple of minutes, we, we see a nice image. Um, much more that can possibly be seen in the, by the naked eye in a similar size telescope. That's beautiful. Yeah, really it's is, looking uh, really good now. Really is incredible. incredible. Yeah. So uh, I guess I'll end the playback there. So during that evening, I uh, I went through a number of objects, but uh, I'm showing uh, this one to you folks uh, this evening. Excellent. So Emil, well, sorry, um, we were talking about that a while back, and our, our last when when you're on. And uh, for some that didn't know that this is actually an, an emission nebula versus a planetary because it does uh, have the um, the look of a planetary just based on the way that it is. But Yeah, I, I, I first thought it was a planetary nebula. I couldn't remember because uh, of its round shape. It seemed like it exploded out of uh, something in the center. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, later on, Chris is going to talk... Uh, to us more about uh, what this object actually is. Sure. Okay. Did you want me to get into how I uh, acquired this? Sure, that'd be great. Okay. So I'll show you folks the setup I used to do all this. So it's all set up in my observatory and I'm obviously not in my observatory right now, but I did take some pictures. You be, should be seeing this now. So this is a photo of my setup uh, of my telescope and mount and pier from within the observatory. So uh, the, the white and black tube is, um, it's called a refractor. And that's a base, basically a telescope that uses lenses only, no mirrors. Uh, it has a 80 millimeter objective. And a triplet means that the, uh, the uh, lens is uh, made up of three pieces. Uh, and, uh, the idea is to um, make it reproduce the uh, colors in good fidelity to avoid something called a chromatic aberration. And if we uh, look uh, from the top down, um, the little blue uh, um, strap there is uh, called a dew heater. And it's plugged into a little box um, that provides power. And that's just to prevent frost and uh, dew from forming on the uh, objective lens, which happens all the time in our climate here in New Brunswick. You, you can't have this running for long before it gets all covered up in dew and frost. 
So it's pretty much uh, essential if you want to acquire uh, data for uh, any significant amount of time. Um, further down the tube, uh, the uh, not the larger camera, but the smaller red one, is something called an off-axis guider. And what that does is it uh, basically monitors the position of a certain star in the field, and it checks if it drifts to the left, to the right, up or down. Uh, if it does, then it'll send uh, commands to the mount to uh, recenter uh, the view. So that, that allows a, a sharper uh, image um, and avoids uh, star trails. Um, before uh, this invention came along, uh, it used to be done all manual. Uh, astronomers would look through a guide scope with a, a little crosshairs and if they noticed the star drifting away from the crosshairs, uh, they'd manually tell the mount to adjust itself and they would have to sit there and watch it all night. I can't imagine how painstaking that must have been. So we're lucky to have the, uh, these gadgets uh, today. Uh, I bet you they all have those, those uh, text, text, text necks. <laughs> Text. I don't know what that is. From leaning over for so Lean many over. hours and not moving. Oh, no, tech next. Okay. Tech, yeah. Uh, no doubt. Further down, uh, the um, flat um, disc shaped thing is called a filter wheel. And this one contains seven filters uh, luminance, red, green, blue, hydrogen alpha. Oxygen three and sulfur two, and uh, I have that because down below uh, it's attached to a monochrome camera, so the camera can't tell if uh, the light coming in is red, green, or blue like a traditional, uh, you know, like your cell phone camera does. Uh, so if I want to record what does it look like in the blue, in the green, and the red. Um, uh, I have to set the filter wheel to the appropriate filter, record frames with that filter on, and then rotate through the other filters to um, obtain a full color image. In the case of the rosette, uh, I was only using the hydrogen alpha filter. It's a narrow band filter that only lets pass the light um, at a certain specific uh, wavelength that's caused by hydrogen being um, excited um, and during that evening I only had the chance to record hydrogen alpha but uh, later this week uh, it looks like the skies might clear up again and I'll record oxygen 3 sulfur 2 and I'll use that to produce a, a false color image and I'll, I'll show you later what I mean by that um, so I, I use a dedicated cooled uh, camera where the chip is, is uh, cooled to a specific temperature. Um, it reduces the amount of noise and makes things more reproducible if you can set a specific temperature. Uh, when you're starting out, uh, a lot of people start out with a DSLR camera and use a special adapter so that it can fit in a telescope. But um, if you want to get really serious into astrophotography, you you soon outgrow the DSLR, and uh, uh, it's nice to have a dedicated uh, astro camera like this. And um, all of this is uh, fitted to a necrotorial mount. So this basically tracks the movement of the heavens in the sky and makes it so that the camera is always looking at the same piece of sky during the whole night. So. It's not a process of taking a snapshot and you're done. The only object you can do that with is the moon. Everything else is a long, laborious process of taking many frames of data and crunching it all together to produce a nice image. The equatorial mount is probably the most crucial piece of equipment uh, for anyone getting uh, wants to be serious about astrophotography. So you, you start with the best equatorial mount you can afford and then uh, try to upgrade the rest of your components uh, 
later on. Um, but important is because uh, it has to track very stably uh, and eliminate a lot of vibrations and movements to get nice pinpoint stars and details. And all this is controlled by um, a mini PC that I have tucked in under there near the pier. And I control the, that mini PC remotely uh, uh, from the house, but I, I can also control it from the observatory uh, when I need to do adjustments. So that's, that's my setup. Uh, it's pretty typical for uh, serious astroimagers to have a, a setup similar to this. Um, I have several telescopes for um, when I went different fields of view. This is the one here that uh, allows me to have the widest field of view, which was appropriate for the Rosette Nebula, which is very, a very wide object in the sky. It spans several widths of the, of the moon in the sky. Um, all this was taken from my uh, observatory. Uh, this is obviously not a recent image. <laughs> Uh, so the roof uh, rolls on uh, tracks and uh, makes it really convenient to leave things all set up and ready to go uh, for each uh, observing or imaging session. That's uh, the inside of my observatory. And so uh, after that imaging session, I kept uh, recording data from the rosette. Um, I must have spent three or four hours just imaging that object. And uh, with uh, processing techniques, you crunch all those frames together. I had like 20 odd frames of the rosette and with uh, uh, processing techniques, uh, you can get to a very nice uh, noise-free image like uh, this here. So this is monochrome because I only acquired uh, data with the hydrogen alpha filter. But after I acquire um, some more data with the other filters, I can combine them and produce a false color image similar to this. Now, this one is not mine. Uh, I just got this from the internet. Um, it's by Chuck Ayub, um, who released this on Wikimedia. So I, I do have permission to uh, uh, reproduce it here. I'm given the, the credit for it. Um, so this here, he combined uh, hydrogen alpha, oxygen three, sulfur two, assigned them to different uh, red, green, and blue. And um, this is a false uh, color result. And, and the different colors, they tell you things about the different parts of the nebula they're looking at. So uh, Assuming uh, um, I don't know which uh, palette he chose, if he chose the Hubble palette, I believe the blue are regions that are richer in hydrogen. Um, and red would be more sulfur. Uh, it, may not, it might not be exactly like that, but that's the general idea. So that was how I... Uh, took that image and uh, this is my ultimate uh, goal when I'm done. And uh, I'll let Chris now talk more about the uh, Rosette Nebula itself. So Great, thanks Emil. To you. Thanks so much Emil. It's um, fantastic. Well, yeah, amazing. Yeah. I'm just gonna talk a couple of minutes about it. If we still got your image up there Emil, maybe we could do that. And then uh, oh. we're, gonna get, we're gonna get the Paul's talk here. Oh, okay, I can leave my image up. Okay. Want to give a shout out to uh, Mike. Uh, had to work tonight. He's usually online with us. That's right. And he's out there working away, earning some bananas. <laughs> uh, probably drinking lots of coffee. And expect. he's online saying hello here and there. So hey, Mike, shout out to you. Yeah. Thanks, Mike, for joining on and for all your help in all the weeks that you've been here so far. Um, so I guess the Rosette Nebula is an emission nebula. I'll get a meal to bring that up again if he can. Oh, have we got you up? Now. Yep, there we go. And the, the nebula is a large cloud of gas and dust that lies near a, a large molecular cloud and is closely associated with the open cluster NGC 2244, whose stars were formed from the nebula's matter in the last uh, five million years. The rosette, 
uh, nebula appearance in optical light resembles uh, a rose or the uh, rosette, the stylized flower design used in sculptural objects since ancient times, and the nebula was named after the design. The nebula has earned the nickname the skull because it is also closely resembles the human skull. So I wonder why I'm not bringing your picture up here. Anybody not clicking on you? Oh, there we are. Gotcha. Oh my God, I'm just seeing the skull right now. Okay. <laughs> For the first time. I, I yeah. just coincidentally have it rotated the way that the skull it, is upright. There it is just right there. It's pure coincidence. Sure, I can see it too. The two eyeballs and the, yeah, the, uh, where the nose would be. Cool. Emil, can you put your mouse on it and show us where the uh, structure is? I don't think my mouse cursor is visible to the audience, but Chris's would be, if Chris would kindly uh, yeah, point sure. it out. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So uh, right here, I guess, that would be one eye. There's the other. Nose here, I expect. Mouth here. You able to see my mouse, or? No, I can't see it. Oh, you can't see my mouse. Okay. That's okay. I, yeah. I, 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 see your, I see your mouse on YouTube. The folks on YouTube can see your mouse. Okay, okay. Okay, let me go there. Okay, I see it, yeah. Can you do it again? Sorry. Sure. Uh, I assume uh, we're looking at one eye there on the right-hand side, and then the other one over here, a uh, small pocket where the nose would be, then the mouth down here at the bottom, the skull here. Never really saw it like that. I think I'd rather see it like the rosette. <laughs> it's not as scary. <laughs> That's amazing. All right. I'm going to have nightmares now. I, I, this is my first time seeing it as a skull. So that's, that's, that's cool. We learned something here at the astronomy show. We do. <laughs> the open cluster NGC 2244 can be seen in binoculars, but to observe the nebula, one needs a telescope with a low magnification and very good viewing conditions uh, without light pollution. The nebula's red color cannot be seen, only recorded photographically. Uh, the Rosette Nebula has an apparent magnitude of about 9.0 and is approximately 5,200 light years distant from Earth. The nebula is a region of intense star formation. The stellar winds from the young stars inside the nebula exert pressure on interstellar clouds and the compression leads to ongoing star forming areas inside the nebula. The Rosette Nebula contains some very hot young stars in its central region, and the gas surrounding these stars has a temperature of about 6 million Kelvin. And as a result, the stars emit intense amounts of X-ray radiation. The nebula's estimated mass is about 10,000 solar masses, which makes the Rosette one of the more massive emission nebula known. And I'm going to drop there because, Paul, you're going to need some time to, to uh, offer your bit. So thank you, Emil. For that well thank you for talking about this object i, I actually learned uh, something <laughs> <laughs> well there now you can hang that up over your bed all right so <laughs> have nightmares. Um, so just for the want of saving some time so all i have to do is just click on my pit or no uh, um sure what's his name chris <laughs> hey yeah hey there chris is going to share the share the picture share my camera is that it no, as long gonna... as i'm not sharing you can see me you're going to share your screen now? No, I shouldn't have to, because I, I should just be on camera. Okay, how's that? Okay, and I'll click let's on wait, it. And... Let's wait for YouTube to pop up. You should be changed out. All right. Whoops. And I'm just going to get myself ready and in position while you're waiting for that. Well, that'll actually be on, on the camera anyway. <laughs> there we go. Perfect, almost. There. There we are. So we should okay, let me know when, when, when I'm up and there. running, because I, 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 I'll go by your graces. We see you now. You see me? Yep. Hey. See me there? Hello, everybody out in YouTube land. <laughs> um, okay, so tonight um, I want to talk about uh, the advantages of the Smith cassegrain Telescope. Um, what Emil showed you earlier was a, um, a refractor, which is basically what he said, just basically a, a tube with a lens on the end of it. Light goes through that tube and then down through and focuses uh, at a certain point. And then you put an eyepiece in and you can see what you want to see. That was actually the first design in telescopes that came out. Um, then um, they came out with what they call a reflector telescope that was designed many, many, many years ago. 
by Sir Isaac Newton and uh, thus named the Newtonian telescope and where it used basically mirrors only. So there was a mirror at the back of the telescope and another mirror coming up about three quarters of the way tilted 45 degrees and it shot that light out to the eyepiece. So when you go down to the bay and watch Chris at the, at the beach, he usually has one of those. He calls it a Dobsonian, but it's just a great big Newtonian is what it is. Um, both of those telescopes are very, very great. Uh, the, the refractors are extremely good for uh, imaging uh, deep sky, simply because they've got, first of all, a very short focal length, and you need that to be able to get, like for example, the rosette that you saw tonight, um, <clears throat> if I tried to record the rosette with this type of a telescope, it wouldn't happen uh, in its native focal length because it, you would just get a small piece of the rosette. With a small refractor, you're getting a much, much wider picture so that uh, you're able to capture a lot of these large nebulas. Um, with a reflector, um, something like the one Chris uses at the beach, the Dobsonian style, most of those, as big as as bulky as they are, are um, still have a relatively short focal length. So even those are, are relatively good. Smaller ones are really good for uh, deep sky stuff. But there's also uh, a need for a telescope that's got a lot of a longer focal length that gives you uh, more magnification uh, natively from the tube itself. And in order to do that, um, if I wanted to have, say, twice the focal length of Chris's Dobsonian telescope, which I'm going to guess is somewhere as close to three and a half, four feet long, um, I'd have to make that eight feet long or, or somewhere thereabouts. I'm not sure how the math works, but it would be considerably longer uh, tube that I have to drag around to get that kind of magnification short of using a Barlow and so on and so forth. Um, so years and years ago, um, they come up with what they call a compound telescope design, which basically means that they're using like the refractor um, lenses, but also like the reflector mirrors. And that's what this telescope here does. Um, it uses a combination of both. So it's called a compound telescope. But in uh, the, the actual makers of this or the designers of the scope were two, um, uh, uh, I, I'm going to assume glass technicians and um, Smith and Cassegrain. And that's where it gets its name, Smith Cassegrain. Or in short, we call it SCT. Smith Cassegrain telescope. And um, the nice thing about the Smith Cassegrain telescope is you've got that magnification, which would be, uh, or focal length, I should say, which in many cases is twice of the telescopes or even three times of some of the telescopes you saw tonight. Uh, but look at how big it is. It's, it's no longer than what Emile's um, small refractor was in his observatory, but yet I can get 2,000 millimeter focal length out of this, where Emile's was probably somewhere in the neighborhood of four to 500 um, uh, millimeters of focal length. So the nice thing about this is if, you're, if you want to see planets um, up nice and close, pictures of the moon, all of those things, you've got the focal length uh, in this compact design. And that's the whole point behind that is where it's so compact, you can actually pick it up, take it out into your dark sky sites. And it's not something that's going to hinder you from, um, you know, from having a really nice view of the sky. And you don't have to be Hulk Hogan to drag it around. And you don't take a lot of space in your car. You can see how small it is. Mind you, it has to sit on top of a mount, something similar to Emile's, but you can get uh, relatively portable mounts for this type of design. So basically, how what this telescope is, um, it has a in the very back of it here, there's a there's a mirror which is about the same width as this tube, and um, and then when you go up to the front of the telescope, I'll just turn this towards you so you can see it here. When you go up towards the front of it, um, you can see actually you can see that mirror in the back, <clears throat> I believe. Let me just see if I can't tilt this a little bit better. There we go. So you can see in the back. There's a very, so I'll put my hand up. You can see my hands going through that mirror. And of course it's magnifying it like crazy, but that's the mirror that you're seeing in the back that my hand is reflecting off of. So what happens is, as the light goes through, there's a, I'm not gonna touch this, but there's a glass um, correcting lens right in the front. And this is where the compound comes in. This is the only lens that's in this telescope. And that's this piece of glass here. And that corrects um, for how the light goes in so that you're not getting um, as much coma and so on and so forth uh, on the edges of the of the mirror. 
And then so it goes through that glass and then it goes down to that mirror that you see in the back and then it bounces back up and then right behind this little disc right in the center, this actually is what they call um, a secondary mirror. So there's actually another mirror there and then that mirror sends it back down and there's a hole in that um, mirror in the back. The reason is because there ha there's a tube that goes through that this little tiny mirror is sending that last bend of light down through that tube and it goes out. Let me show you. So it comes back down through here and it comes out down where, if you're using a camera, it'll go into the camera. If you're using an eyepiece, it'll go into your eyepiece. So that's basically what happens. So the light comes in, hits the mirror in the back, bounces up, hits the mirror again that's, that's in the face of this, and then goes right down and into whatever it is that you want to see. So that, that's what you would call um, uh, a compound telescope. Um, the native um, F ratio of this telescope is called F10. Because it's such a long distance that that light's got to go through by the time it comes through, bounces, bounces again and goes back down through that tube and then up into your eyepiece. It takes a long time for that light to travel. So like a camera lens, um, it's not really efficient. So if you're familiar with camera lenses, uh, if you've got a lens that say it's a, an F5 or, a, or an F8 uh, versus an F2, well, that F2 lens on a camera lens is what happens is you can actually open up that aperture wider and wider and let more light in. With the, with the telescope, it's a mode of light efficiency, but works a little differently in that if I wanted to say use a Mule's telescope that he shot the rosette with, that one probably would have been somewhere around an F5, somewhere in that neighborhood. So, um, um, so his telescope uh, gets the light much quicker because he's got a lot shorter focal length to go through. The nice thing about this, the versatility that this telescope has is I'm not stuck with an F10 focal ratio with this. Here's the beauty of this scope. So the first thing that you can do is you can buy what they call a reducer. And, uh, and what a reducer is, is just basic as a piece of glass. Um, it's, it's another lens system, if you will. And let me see if I can get this so you can see it. So what that does, um, this actually reduces the length by on uh, this one, you can see that they're not, it reduces the length, the focal length of that telescope. I don't know if you can see that number, but that's called six, I think it's 6.3, yeah. So this turn, this goes to F6.3. So instead of that telescope being a 2000 millimeter focal length, now I'm down to somewhere around 1400. Yeah, somewhere in that range of 14 to 1500. No, it might even be less than that. Actually, this one with this, probably somewhere around 12 or 1300 focal length. So what that's done effectively is it's taken my telescope now um, and I can actually gain light quicker because in effect, it's given me the, uh, the, the, a shorter, um, the illusion of a shorter light path through this optic. So now I've got F6.3, it's, it's more efficient. The beauty of the efficiency with that is it also increases my field of view. So now I can actually take and look at or photograph larger objects because this focal reducer has taken it down to F6.3, but it doesn't stop there. So now, if I wanted to get um, the best of both worlds, first of all, <coughs> whoops, oh my God, there we are, oh, sorry, you're still here. <laughs> I, I'm we back, gotcha. <laughs> first of all, um, <laughs> The reason for using a telescope like this with, with glass this, this big is because I have a very, very wide um, piece of glass here. So I have eight inches of aperture. So in the observing world, aperture is king because you get more photons with a larger mirror. But the beauty of this now is I've got a larger aperture telescope. I can take this secondary mirror out and I'm gonna show you how to do that. So all we do is we just unscrew the ring that's holding that mirror in place. That ring just comes off there. That mirror comes out and there's that secondary mirror we were talking about. And so it's pretty thick. So it's a, it's a very nice high quality mirror. So that's basically what sends the signal back down the tube and into your eyepiece. But if we take this out and let me show you what we can do Uh, 
If I could learn to open the case, maybe. <laughs> there we go. So there's a company in um, in Arizona called Star Arizona, and they're uh, an astronomy company based out of uh, Arizona, and I think that's where they got the name Star Arizona. And they make what they call the hyperstar lens. And what a hyperstar lens is, it's a lens that's going to go in the place of that mirror that I just took out. And basically, this little thing just screws off the back, which is covering its lens. And I'll put my secondary in there, actually, just to keep it safe. And it's always in good order to be very careful with that secondary because if you scratch it, you're in deep. So basically, this do is do. another lens right here. And that just basically just screws on the front of the telescope. Now, this is for imaging only, like this F ratio I'm talking about. This is going to take this telescope down to F2, which is extremely fast. So once you've got down that lens on, then this little piece pulls off the top, and then your camera actually screws on here. So when you put your camera on there, then basically what's happening is this, the light comes in through the telescope, hits that mirror in the back, bounces up right into the camera because it's going through this lens. So you're saving all that life path. So now you're down to an F2 focal, uh, 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 ratio, and you've reduced your focal length to about, uh, I think, a right around 460 millimeters. So now you've got a telescope, and I haven't even talked about Barlow's yet, but now you've got a telescope that'll give you F10, great for planetary, uh, close up on the moon, far away galaxies that are really small, and you've got the aperture to give you the extra light to get that stuff. If you want something a little uh, wider, you can go to F6.3, uh, and still use all your stuff traditionally in the back for either visual or for uh, photographing. Or if you want to use this rig here and go to F2 for photographing, um, then you can get extreme wide field views. It's going to be very forgiving on your mount because the wider field and the shorter the focal length, the smaller the objects are, although you're getting a wider picture, but it, it puts a lot less demand on your mount when you're tracking. So if you're starting out in astrophotography, um, F2 is not a difficult thing to play with. I would certainly start with a small refractor first, but on the other hand, you can go with F2 and you'd be quite surprised how forgiving all that is. So, um, and these particular telescopes come in a variety of sizes. You can get them at a six inch, uh, an eight inch, which is what this one is, a nine and a quarter, an 11 and a 14. And it's mid Cassegrain. This particular one here is made by a company called uh, Celestron. And, um, and this one came from one of the um, uh, telescope packages that you buy on a, on a, on a mount. S, it's called the SE. This would have been the 8 SE. If it was a 6 inch, it would have been a 6 SE. And, but it's the same optics that they use in, in, the, in the black um, telescopes as well. They do make another telescope like this, and it's called the Edge. It has, has different optics in it. It's got a different corrector plate down that center whole area. Um, so there's a number of different types of smith cassegrains that you can get, but these are the ones that you'll find that are most common out there. And they make a wonderful visual telescope. They make a wonderful uh, photography telescope. Gives you all the variety and focal lengths. You can buy um, white light filters to put on the front of them. So if you want to look at the sun or image the sun, that kind of stuff. So it's probably, in my estimation, um, the most um, uh, uh, Versatile. Thank you. Versatile. The most versatile telescope out there. And um, so when I get to talk about uh, Smith Cassegrain telescopes, I get a little excited because they are a fun telescope. They're easy to collimate, which just basically means when you have to line up your optics, they are really, really quite simple to line up. Uh, they're nice and compact. They come in a variety of sizes. You can, you can get a whole bunch of different types of mounts, depending if you want to be visual or uh, photographic with them. And um, that's my story. That's, that's on the Smith Cassegrain telescope. <laughs> I like it, Paul. That's great. <clears throat> nice talk. If I, if I may uh, comment. Please. Yes. Um, you mentioned it in passing, but I think it should be emphasized that if you're just getting started into astrophotography, mm -hmm. that the, this is a very challenging way to do it with this uh, telescope. Well, maybe not very, but more challenging and I, I'd, re I'd recommend that um, most people start off with a refractor 
Yeah, absolutely. Get their feet wet. and Or if you already have the Schmidt cast grain as your visual instrument and you want to dabble in astrophotography, then by all means, go ahead. Use what you have. Yeah. But um, you'll find you'll get more uh, satisfying results right off the bat with a short refractor. Yeah, absolutely. And, and as your uh, skills uh, allow, then you can move on to uh, something with a longer focal length like this. Yeah. You know, it's funny, Emil, that you mentioned that, and, and I agree with you 100%. Uh, starting out in the field with, a, with a, a refractor is better because you don't really have to worry about collimation. It's a straightforward tube. They're quite small. They're easy to handle. The optics are extremely forgiving, but you're getting sharp, contrasty pictures. You're getting the widest field of views right to, right away. But when I started out, and, and I, you know, because I'm, I'm like one of those people that just has to do it, trip or fall, but you do it anyway. I started out with the, with the um, Hyperstar right, right, right from the get-go. Wow. And, um, and you're right. It was difficult. I had to learn a lot. Um, you know, right from the get go, but, um, but I, w I would agree with Emil, if you're going to start and you've already got a Smith Cassegrain, you want to step up, certainly go to that. But yeah, definitely start with a small refractor first and you'll have so many more rewarding nights, in, you know, right away without going through uh, some of the stuff that I went through to, uh, to figure that out. So yeah, thanks Emil. That's perfect. So Paul, we'll get a question here from Irene, uh, who's asking about the average price. Okay. Um, if you're just buying the telescope tube itself, um, you know, they vary in price. Um, typically if you buy one like, like, like this brand new, somewhere's around anywhere from $9.99 to $12.99, depending on where you get it. If you buy the SC tube, it's cheaper, which, which is the orange colored one, than it is to actually buy the black colored one, but they're, the optics are, they're, are identical. So there's, you know, you're not, you're not giving anything up by going to the orange. Um, if you buy a six inch, t uh, one of these, which is a smaller, more compact one, but still a very, very, very worthy scope. Um, you can get those for in the neighborhood of around six to $700 for the OTA brand new. Now, if you go to a used market and that's where a lot of us buy our telescopes, um, on a place called, um, uh, what is it, Chris? Astro buy sell. Thank you very much. <laughs> on Astro buy sell. And, um, you can pick up a telescope like this on average, three fifty four hundred dollars for the eight inch. Um, you can get a telescope with a tripod, and I wouldn't recommend a German equatorial mount for somebody just starting out. I would go to one of the SE mounts, which is just basically it's a it's a little mount that you mount your telescope right to the side of it. It's just one arm that sticks up, and it gives you uh, alt as he. Uh, motions. Very, very easy to use, very comfortable. You won't find yourself in funny positions. You don't have to do the polar aligning and all that stuff you have to do with a telescope or um, with a mount like that. But anyway, you can get packages like those typically new uh, for with a six inch for right around thousand dollars. So used market six to seven hundred dollars for uh, the tube and usually it comes with eyepieces it'd be pretty much a full kit by the time you get it. And that is what they have or what they would call go to electronics in it. So that means if you just want to look at an item, once you do a little bit of a lining, uh, uh, if you want to look at Saturn, you punch in Saturn and then the telescope will just slew right to Saturn. So you can look at that. If you want to look at whatever else, you just punch it in and away you go. Whoops. Back out again. <laughs> no, you're here. We got you. Okay. Yeah. My screen goes black here. Okay. So I, I, Irene, I hope that answers your question for, uh, for that. I think it does, and uh, I guess, I guess uh, the other thing is, Paul, that when we talk about $1,000 or $1,500 or $2,000 for a telescope, yeah, you know, that, that is a lot of money to people, mm -hmm. but the idea is that these, these are lifetime scopes. Like, this is something that you'll never have to uh, upgrade if you don't want to. You can stay with that style scope and that model scope right there for, for forever, if you like pass it down to the next generation. Uh, the, the sky doesn't change, so the stars are always in the same place, the planets are, are in the same place uh, each time of the year, so all that all that stuff stays the same. So there's really no need to upgrade if you don't want to. I mean, my 12-inch uh, my daub is a manual scope. Uh, it doesn't have anything, anything on it that has to be upgraded, no software that has to be updated. So you can keep that for a lifetime, and you can with this scope too. So think about the fact that if it's $1,000 or $1,500, uh, what would it cost you to, to buy a snowmobile or to, uh, you know, to, to buy a nice, uh, decent bike or anything like that? 
And yeah. these these really do hold their value because most astronomers that have equipment like this uh, really look after it. So they have a high resale value uh, after after a number of years. If you're if it's something that you're not quite into, maybe you want a smaller scope or a grab and go scope to, to carry around uh, later on. Uh, these these have a very high resale value and they're always uh, well cared for with uh, with astronomers. So absolutely, and 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 to make another um, uh, verification with uh, Emil's point. Um, a small refractor makes an absolutely wonderful visual telescope as well. So, and because it's so small and portable, you're more likely to take that telescope out quite a bit more in the beginning because there's not a lot that you have to know in terms of setup to set it up. Basically, get it on your mount. If it's a manual mount, you can just learn your sky a little bit and point it where you want. You just dial in your focus and that's all you have to do. So that is another big advantage for somebody beginning in astronomy um, to get, you know, favorable um, uh, first experiences with a smaller telescope, certainly. Excellent. I'd, Thanks. I'd add that a small refractor, um, if you have access to dark skies, they're great because they give you these wide, uh, enjoyable fields of view. But uh, within a urban or suburban setting, uh, there will be too much light pollution um, to really appreciate the views. And that's where more aperture, uh, a larger telescope uh, is more essential in a suburban setting. So the more you magnify, the more it darkens the background sky and the more contrast uh, you'll see in the objects. Mm -hmm. So while it's true that they're very easy to use and enjoyable small refractors at a dark sky site, they're portable. Uh, don't take much room in a car. Uh, don't expect to get enjoyable moons, uh, enjoyable views in the in the city, unless you're just looking at the moon or something. Yeah, right. yeah, some some of the brighter objects for sure. Uh, I'll just go with, off with a couple of uh, questions here. Steve uh, asked, uh, "What about Dobsonian type, which gives the widest uh, field?" I guess is what he's asking. Uh, viewing field. Viewing field. I guess. Okay. What about Dobsonian type, which give the widest viewing field? Um, well. Dobsonian telescopes give you the, the biggest bang for your buck, for sure. Um, you get the largest mirror for the cheapest amount of money, and uh, man, they're manual, so I, I always recommend a Dobsonian because it's what they use <laughs> mostly, but probably be, I, I recommend them because it, it forces you to learn the night sky. Uh, you, you have to take it out and find objects on your own. And it's not as hard as that sounds. Uh, and the thing is that you can go out and find uh, the moon easily, and the planets are easy to find. When you start looking at constellations and you're looking for galaxies or star clusters or things like that, uh, once you find it once, it's, it's fairly easy to go back and get it again the next time. Uh, and again, the, the stars aren't, aren't moving. They're not uh, changing from year from year, for our, from our point of view anyway. So all the objects that we see in our summertime sky are going to remain in our summertime sky. So I would recommend a Dobsonian for that type of uh, abuse. Um, and I see Mike Powell's on here saying a six-inch SET does it all. He's right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so Telescopes, the thing about the different types is uh, you sometimes get into uh, religious wars with uh, astronomers. <laughs> Everyone has their favorite. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The best telescope is the one you use the most. That's so absolutely. It boils down to that. Absolutely. If, uh, if I may comment on the uh, widest uh, viewing field thing for Dobsonian, uh, if you look at focal lengths of Dobbs at different sizes, a 10 inch is usually around 1200. If you look at an 8 inch, it's still 1200. And a 6 inch is still around 1200. So they do that on purpose so that the tube is long enough for you to use it comfortably uh, without crouching on the ground. Mm -hmm. So it's roughly only beyond the 10 inch aperture where your views are going to start to narrow with a given set of eyepieces. So my first telescope was a 10 inch daub and I absolutely don't regret that purchase at all. It was great. I, I had very well uh, wide fields of view. I could get the Pleiades in there, most of Andromeda, uh, and it, it had a decent amount of aperture. And the only thing you have to watch out is if the size of the telescope is something you're comfortable lugging around and packing right. in your car. Right. It was in my case, but I admit it might not be so for everyone. And that's where the SETs really do have the advantage, for sure. 
they're <laughs> they're they're more portable, more compact, I guess, um, and they and they are a great all-around scope for sure. They are. Guys, I guess we're at uh, we're at five minutes after nine. Wow, did that oh, ever go by fast? Well, before we go, okay. you, you, instru you instructed me to remind yes. you <laughs> about the photographs. <laughs> yes. So um, I've, I've yet to get a, an email address set up, though, for Paul. Uh, that's so I I would say that if you can find me on social media, um, send some photos through, and we'll fo we'll uh, we'll uh, focus on those uh, next week. So if you have any photos that you've taken of the moon, the planets, uh, any deep sky objects, uh, send them on to me. And uh, we'll be sure to, uh, to bring them up next week and, and we'll talk a little bit about them. And uh, we'd love to have uh, your opinions back on this as well. Um, so uh, we did, we get a lot of good comments on, on the type of scope here that we offered here tonight. So maybe that's what we'll be doing in the future as well. We'll, uh, we'll offer another type of scope and uh, we'll get a talk done on that as well. Uh, I guess uh, if you've really enjoyed uh, what we're running here for our 10th week, uh, happy anniversary to us, I guess. <laughs> we're... Uh, <laughs> We're at the point of number 10 now. Uh, just give us a like here on the page and uh, don't forget to subscribe as well if you can. Uh, we really appreciate it. That helps get it out to a bigger audience for us and that's what it's all about here for us as well. So I guess uh, for now, I want to say thanks to Emil uh, very much and Paul, you as well. Great to have you guys on. And from me, uh, Chris from Astronomy by the Bay, we'll say good evening and wish you all clear skies and we'll talk to you all again next week. Bye. Good night.